house of God If you love, you're born of it Love washed away The multitude of sin My wife had mentioned to me during the week I don't know, she might have been reading it in one of her fish wrapper papers or something she was looking at. She said that um, she was talking about churches. And I had just taught recently what I've entitled Changing Churches and Why People Change Churches. And she said that I, was a, I guess it was a southern minister and one of the people in the congregation came to him after the service and he said to the minister he says as long as you were preaching you were doing just fine he says but today you started meddling so i'm leaving your church so what that means is as long as people preach and it's okay, it's not directed, or you're agreeing with it, you're good. But whatever that minister had preached that day, it started to meddle in that guy's life. And then he was confronted that he would have to change his life. And so instead of changing his life, he turned, decided to just turn around and leave. Go figure. Everybody comes from a story. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a background. Everybody has situations that they grow up in, that they're continuing to go through, and that will face us in life. And to one degree or another, everybody's broken. Everybody's damaged. Some more than others, but... Nobody escapes the world, the children in the schoolyard, the mother, the father that was abusive, drugs, alcohol, whatever your story is, nobody escapes it. Some are more damaged than others, but that's the world and that's how the world affects people. You have to understand that. You also have to understand that God has no hands but our hands. So that means that anyone who is going to aspire to do anything from God is a damaged person. Is a wounded person. There is no perfect people. If you look at the lives of some of the men and women of God in the Bible, God chose some of the weakest men, some of the ones that made the most mistakes, and gave them responsibilities. Peter was the first one who preached a sermon in the day of Pentecost. And if you read Peter's life, Peter made some big mistakes. You know, even afterwards... Uh, the, the crucifixion. Peter's testimony was, I'm going fishing. I'm going, he had it. He was done. He just, I'm going back fishing. And yet he rose up. What you have to understand is that God is not limited. But God can and God will work through and past your damaged life in spite of it because your damaged life and your brokenness doesn't stop God's love and God's healing if you endeavor to want to serve him and do things for him you can't feel unworthy you can't condemn yourself you can't be convinced of the lie that I will do something for God 
when I'm in a position that I can do something for God. Because you will never be in a position that you can do something for God. You will always fall short. See? That's why we have Jesus Christ. He didn't fall short. And where we fall short, he makes up for us. There are promises in God's word that are available to you if you choose to believe the promise in God's word and to act accordingly. Okay? In the military, you can raise your hand. You can volunteer for something, and if you volunteer for that, you can receive the training and the benefit of that particular class. You can understand the weapon, and how to use it, and apply it to your life. Not everybody raises their hand and says, I want to volunteer for such and such. And that's okay. But God's word is like that. God's word is full of promises. And if you choose to believe the promise of God, then you can apply the promise of God to your life. Some people remain single for a lifetime. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what you choose to do. See? And there's promises of God that are directed to single individuals. There's promises in God's word about marriage. So if you want to apply those promises with regards to marriage, you can go to it and do that. There's promises in God's word about peace. If you have peace that you want to seek after. There's promises in God's word about wisdom and how to gain wisdom, this sort of thing. Okay? So God's word is not only his will, but it's also a book of promises. Now, if, if you want to apply them, if you, if you want God's wisdom, if you want God's knowledge, if you want God's peace, you go to the Word of God, you find what the Word of God says about that, and then if that's something you want in your life, you apply it, okay? All right. Now, having said that, I want to talk to you this morning about a promise in God's Word that's given and available to those people who seek this promise, okay? Because not everybody goes after every promise in God's word. All right. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read to you a scripture out of the New International. In verse 7 it says... <clears throat> Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? This promise is to those who are cheerful givers. Alright? Now... It was Oral Roberts that came up with the plan that he would never spend more than three minutes talking about giving during his service. That he would de dedicate three minutes time to tell people about whatever, and then you would move on.
God doesn't need your money. I want you to know that. He owns the universe. You understand? Chapter and verse doesn't need your money. Okay? I don't need your money either. Okay? This house has been paid for for eons. Okay? And it's been paid for from the finances that I earned. Not one penny went in it to pay from the church for this house. Okay? You will always have a place to come. The electric will always be paid for. It will always be warm. And it will always be cool in the summer. See? And that's part of our giving. All right? So, a lot of people don't like to touch the subject of giving. Well, what I'm going to teach you this morning is a promise of God. And I'm going to present to you a promise of God that if you so choose to want this promise and the benefits of this promise in your life, then you can freely apply the principles in God's word to receive it. All right? And that's the promise of giving with a cheerful heart. God doesn't want people to give reluctantly or under compulsion. <clears throat> and there's a lot of people out there that talk about money and they threaten people. And they go into the Old Testament and they threaten people in the book of Malachi. And the preachers will actually turn around and say that if you do not tithe, you, God will curse you. That's a lie. Okay? That is a lie. God doesn't curse people today, in this day, and in this time, if you do not tithe. Okay? What they do is they take something from the Old Testament, and they're trying to apply it in the New Testament. If you're going to use that logic, you might as well just get back into the sacrificial uh, offerings of the animals. Because if you didn't do it back then, God didn't look your way either. We don't live in that period of time anymore. Okay? But giving is a principle. In God's word. And if you want to operate that principle in God's word, you can. And I want to tell you that having faithfully operated the principle set forth in God's word with regards to financially giving and supporting the ministry for over 40 years, that I can tell you first class and firsthand that the word of God works. You see, when I went to build my body shop, I had no money. Literally, I had no money. But I had a goal, and I had a promise of God. And as I started to move out on the promise of God, God fulfilled my needs as I met and worked and continued to serve him. I had no builder. And I searched for a builder. I had an uncle that was a builder. But the price that he gave me and the price that I had in my mind was only half of a place that was going to get built. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't afford that. So, I was working one day and someone that I don't even know walked in and got to talking and I overheard something. And I talked to my brother and I said, well, we need to go see this guy. This guy's name was Sam, and Sam was an Amish guy. So Sam worked at the chicken market over in Wynwood. But his real trade was they were masons, they were builders. So I said, let's go see Sam. Never met the guy before. We got in the car that weekend. We went over and we visited Sam. Walked in, introduced ourselves. He invited us behind the counter. He said, you see these chickens here, Nick? He said, people think that the Amish women get up at 3 in the morning. They chase these chickens around. They kill them and I sell them to you fresh. He said, we get these chickens from New York. They're shipped in on a train. 
He says, they just want to see us dressed up. They want to see our little hats. And they buy, and then they give me more money than what the chickens are worth. <laughs> he said, what can I do for you? And all I had was a piece of paper. No plans. I had a piece of paper. And it made a big rectangle. I said, this is what I want. He said, I could do that. He shook hands. And I left. So, we went... We went to a zoning hearing, because you had to get a zoning hearing. The guy went with us. We had to be represented. Long and short of that was we walked out of the zoning hearing, got the zoning variance, and the lawyer who represented us didn't charge us anything. So we needed to start accumulating money and finding things. I had had a house on Chestnut Avenue at the time. I was willing to put up for collateral. The bank came out with five different people in suits. They walked down. And in those days, the bank people would look at you and that judge you on your integrity and judge you on your speech. And they look farther than what they do today because today it's all on paper. So we wound up borrowing $70,000, which I put a 6,000 square foot building up on the roof for $70,000. So in the meantime, through mutual friends, I met a guy who worked in Hollywood who was involved in making movies. And they were shooting in a movie out here in Philadelphia with Jody Foster, and they needed automobiles for their movies. So my brother finds the automobiles. We wind up painting the automobiles. They crash the automobiles in the movie. We wind up fixing them, and painting them again. Winter time comes, they don't finish the movie. So they wind up paying us to store the vehicles for them so they come back next year and finish the movie. One thing led to another, and if you know anything about Hollywood, they're just ridiculously sick with money. <laughs> they would have the movie cast there, and they would have maybe five, six thousand dollars catered every day of food. Just ridiculous, and they throw the food away just to feed the people. Long story short, the cars that we did have were very expensive cars. We got them for practically peanuts. I was able to sell those cars to gain more money to put towards the building. God had supplied that need. Okay? So we needed an office. Didn't have an office. Okay? Well, my sister was in charge of a building, and the building was federally funded, and the government came in and says, you have to get rid of all this stuff because we're going to outfit you with new furniture. She called me up. I went down. I got desks. I got chairs. I got filing cabinets. I got four-by-four four railroad ties. I got everything. I still have that furniture in my office. Okay? For free. Just get rid of it. We needed a paint booth. And I had looked around, looked around, looked around. I've done what I could do. And then one day I got a phone call. Out of the blue. From a guy in Silverdale. Who said, I hear that you're looking for a paint booth. I said, yes I am. He said, well I know a guy at CNC Ford. Who's getting a brand new paint booth in. And he told me that he got to get rid of this old one. And he says he will give it to you if you will go up and just take it. They have to tell me twice. <laughs> <laughs> so with my father and my, I think my brother stayed, we would just go back and forth. We'd go up to C&C, <clears throat> and we had a flatbed with rollback, which you carry cars on. We'd load, took the panels down. But it wasn't just a paint booth. It was a paint booth, and then it was a baking part of it in back of it. So we took this whole thing down, 
took pictures, brought it back, assembled it in our paint area. I had the garage separated to where it was a 30 by 60 um, section where I could put a paint booth at. And a roofer came in, put the exhaust work up. The exhaust work and the flashing and the metal work was all donated to me from another guy that knew us for a hundred years. They want to do something for you. And that paint booth is still in my building today. So we needed to wire the garage. Okay. Well, long story short, bought what we needed, wired the garage up, got the panel. I went to the electrician who wired the garage. I said, how much do I owe you? He says, you don't owe me nothing. He says, you have done more for me and my family than ever could be repaid. He says, and his wife would cook and bring <laughs> food down the garage at night while he was working and I was helping him and my brother was there. This sort of thing. So we needed to plumb the garage. And, uh, Chuck, who used to come here as a plumber, he came out. He did all the plumbing, all the air lines, all whatever that needed to be done. And we made uh, some type of a deal. No money ever transpired. I think I helped him out with a car or something, whatever. So that need was taken care of. Okay. So all of these things God provided for me. You understand? And that's a direct manifestation of the promise that God gives in his word of a cheerful giver. Because every week faithfully we would give. Every week faithfully we still give. My wife writes a check to chapter and verse every week faithfully. Because there's promises in God's word that you can apply and if you want the blessing of it, that's fine. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 6, the scripture says, But this I say unto you, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully <coughs> shall reap also what? Bountifully. See, God shows us his promise. And he says to us, if you trust my word, if you believe me, I'm going to show you how you can receive my abundant blessing in this particular area of life. Now, anybody knows that a farmer who plants one seed is going to receive the crop of the seed that he plants. But that's not a farmer. See, a farmer goes, he tills his field, and he plants what? A whole bunch of seeds. Right? And so he receives that of the abundance that he plants. It's the same with the word of God. If you plant a penny, a seed, then you receive what you plant. If you plant more, you receive what you more. That's what the scripture is saying. But I want you to understand this too. That if you only have a penny to plant, literally a penny, then between you and God, that's as much as a million dollars. Okay? See, it's not the amount. It's what is proportional in your heart. In Mark chapter 12, In verse 41, look what Jesus was doing one day. It says, Jesus sat over against the treasury. And he beheld how people cast money into the treasury and how many that were rich put in a lot of money. There came a poor widow and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. She's a couple pennies. And he called unto him his disciples. He brought his leadership in. You know why? Because he was going to teach him a lesson. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow 
had cast in more than all they which has cast into the treasury. For they did it out of their abundance, but she did it out of the want that she had even all of her living. You see? What she did, she did from her heart. And she did trusting God. That God would take that seed that was sown and give it back to her. You know, some places have envelopes. This way they can keep track of what you give. And if you don't give the right amount, you know what they do? They threaten you. What you give is none of my business. What you give is between you and God. You understand? It's between you and God. And your heart to give is none of my business. Your heart to give is between you and God. But you should know that the scripture teach and what the scriptures teach with regards to giving. In Proverbs chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all <clears throat> thine increase. When you give, you honor God. And it says you should give and honor God with the first fruits of your increase. So back then, their increase was an agricultural community. They had vegetables, and they had wheat, and they had corn, this sort of thing. So what they would do is they would take a bushel, and they would put that in, and they would offer it to God. Now, they didn't just go and put it on a hill and offer it to God. What they would do is they would take it to the priest. They would take it to the men of God that was responsible for the work. And the men of God, the priests, the Levites, the people who worked around there, they lived of that. That's how they lived. So they could devote their full time to God's <clears throat> people. But that's the principle. That's the promise, right? Now, look at the result in the next verse. When you honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase, so shall thy barns, verse 10, be filled with what? Plenty. Plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with what? New wine. New wine. You understand? God just doesn't take what you give and say thank you very much. God takes what you give and he's able to bless you back. You see, all of those things that I mentioned... God gave them to me because we always gave with a cheerful heart because we want to see the word of God move. And God provided those things for us. Look at Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read this to you out of the New Living Translation. verse 38 Luke 6 38 the new living says if you give you will what receive look you don't till a garden and don't put any seed in the garden and then go out four months later looking for peppers or tomatoes or eggplants you know why you wouldn't do that would you that's silly because you didn't put any seeds in this is what the scripture is saying. If you give, you will receive. If you plant, you'll reap. Your gift will return to you in full measure. Talking about giving. Press down, shaking together to make room for more and what? Running over. It's an Orientalism. What it means is they would take it, the bushel. You guys do this. And they put it in, and then they would press it down, then it would shake it, so it would compact even more. And then when it compacted even more, what was on top? More room, right? And then they put more in it, and they shake it and compact it even more, to where it was just so dense that the return of your gift got filled to the top, and it what? Overflowed. See, that's what God's saying. That's his abundant provision back to the person that gives. Okay? 
If your gift will return in full measure, press down, shaking together to make room for more and running over, whatever you measure your use in giving, large or small, it shall be used to measure what is giving back to what? Uh, it's you. You determine. You, you determine a penny, then you do a penny. That's small. You determine a dollar, then you do a dollar. That's bigger. But whatever you determine, it'll be measured back to you. Why? Because if you plant one seed, you're going to get the fruit of one seed. But if you go and you plant a hundred seeds, you're going to get what? The fruit of a hundred seeds. See, this is the truth about giving and operating this principle of financial abundance in your life. It's not a threat. It's not a, you're going to be cursed. No. It's a simple promise of God. And the doctrine is pure. And if you choose to apply it to your life, at least you're aware of it. If you don't want to apply it to your life, that's fine. It's okay. Because it's none of my business. That's between you and God. Okay. Deuteronomy. Well, let's look at Chronicles. That's before Deuteronomy. First Chronicles 29. First Chronicles 29, verse 9. Again, this is talking about giving. It says, the people rejoiced. The people rejoiced. For they that offer willingly, because with a perfect heart, they offered willingly unto the Lord. You see it? And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. You can't be told this is what you have to give. You understand? That's, compu that's, compu that's compulsion. You can't be threatened what you have to give. You have to sit down with God and decide in your heart what you want to do. If you want to do anything. See? That's simply the truth of God's word. But God wants it offered with a willing heart. And it brings great joy when you do that. And when you see the abundance that God's able to give back to you. Now Deuteronomy. You see, in the Old Testament, I'm going to show you where the whole tithing thing came in. Because the word tithe means 10%. Okay? And that's where a lot of churches today say you've got to give 10% of your income. Some say gross, some say net, some say in between. But this is where it originated from. Not really, though. But I'm going to show you. Deuteronomy 14, verse 21 says... 22. Thou shalt tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. So again, it was fruits and vegetables. You got a hundred watermelons. You gave ten watermelons to the priest. That's a tithe. And every year you do that. You continue to do that. That was according to the law of Moses. That's what God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. But I want you to know that that's not where it originated at. You see, tithing was around much, much longer than the law of Moses. It preceded the law of Moses. Okay? In Genesis chapter 14. Now, Genesis 14 is where you have Abraham. Abraham was way before Moses. Abraham was way before the nation of Israel. All right? And in verse 18 of Genesis 14, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, for he was the priest of the Most High God. He was a representative of God. And he blessed him. He blessed Abraham. Abraham which we change later, Abram. And he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of the heaven and the earth. And he blessed the Most High God, which had delivered, blessed the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hands. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, what? Tithes, Tithes of all. So you see, the 10% was around long before the law of Moses. It was a custom in ancient 
cultures to give a percentage to their gods or to the one who represented God. And this could be tracked through history. Genesis 28, verse 20. And Jacob, now Jacob is Abraham's grandson. Okay? Jacob vowed a vow saying, verse 20, if God be with me, and will keep me in the way that I go, and shall give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come into my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all I shall give, that he shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto what? This is before Israel. This is before Moses. This is before the law. Again, you see the ancient custom of giving 10%. All right. So you see that Abraham's grandson observed this custom. In Leviticus 27, verse 30. Now you're getting to where the law was written, and you're going to see what God's opinion of the tithe is. Leviticus 27, 30, and all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the land, is what? Lord's it's the Lord's. Lord's. It belongs to God. And it's what? Holy, Holy unto the Lord. You see it? In the law, he says, this is what belongs to me. <clears throat> and it's holy unto me. And this is the way that God would have his people give so that the tabernacle, later on the temple, the priesthood, the Levitical line, the things of God, the offerings, the sacrifice, all these things. So there was money that those things could be done. Now in Malachi chapter 3, God confronts the people of the olden days, in verse 7, in Malachi 3, because the word of God says, it belongs to me. That's what God said in the Old Testament. This is, tenth is mine. And not only is it mine, it's what? It's holy unto me. Malachi 3, 7, it says, from the days of your father, you have gone away from mine ordinance. And you have not kept them. This is God confronting his people. He says, return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you say, wherein shall we return? God said to them, you haven't kept my word. You've walked away from me. He's saying, come back to me. But the answer of the people was, we haven't walked away from you. What are you talking about? That's what they're saying. Now look what God says in verse 8. Will a man rob God? But yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein hath we robbed you? How did we rob you, God? And he goes the answer. He says, in tithes and in offerings, you haven't given. Because in the law, they were commanded to what? Give. Give. Because it belonged to who? And when you steal something that belongs to somebody else, it's called what? Robbery. All right? Now... This is where the preachers get this. Verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. In those days, under the law administration, when they didn't follow the law, there were consequences. Okay? Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Remember I told you that the money given was to supply for the things of God? He said that there may be meat in my house. But look at the promise he gives back to them. He says, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not even going to have room enough to receive it. Again, it's the law of giving and receiving. God says, you plant, you do this, 
and he says, prove me. Just try it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open the windows of heaven, and I'm going to pour you out a blessing that you got. You don't have a clue. Okay? And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall the vine cast her fruit before the fields at the Lord of hosts. You see? Look, if you don't get a harvest in, you lose money. <clears throat> you understand? But when they gave, God's abundant provision was the promise that, look, your harvest is going to make it to the end. It's not going to cast the fruit off before the end, and you're going to have a lot. God's protection is there. Verse 12 says, And the nation, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of what? Of hosts. What God said, he said, listen, you can accomplish more with 90% and me working with you than you can with 100% of your own money and without me working with you. That's what he's telling them. Now, we do not live in the Old Testament. Do you understand? God will not curse a person today because the law does not apply to us today. Now, there are segments of the law that carry over. I understand that. But this does not apply because the Word of God says that Jesus Christ hung on the tree who became a curse for us. And he took away all of that. He took away all of that. So to make a statement that you need to give 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, it's nothing but legalism. It's a law. And you can't do that because you can't back it up in the New Testament scriptures by the word of God. It doesn't, there's nothing in there. The New Testament scriptures says that God loves a cheerful giver. And whatever that individual has determined in their heart, so that each individual give. If one individual determines 1%, that's their business. And they do it cheerfully, that's their business. If the other individual decides on 30% and is cheerful, that's their business. See? This is just the promises... This is just the doctrine behind giving and receiving. And it's simply an instructional teaching to let you know that if you choose to operate the principle of God with regards to this, what you can do, how to do it, what kind of heart to do it with, and what God, what to expect back from God. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. See, the curse was done away in Christ Jesus. You don't threaten people to give. You don't kick people out because they don't give. You don't throw people out of the school because they can't afford to get you. That's stupid. And then you call yourself a loving Christian school or a loving <coughs> Christian church. Every year we used to get a pack of envelopes, 52 envelopes. 52 envelopes. My tithe would have been, <coughs> save the money you took to print my... 52 envelopes. Amen. But every year you got 52 envelopes. And you were to put your name on it and you were to put how much is in there. See, that's why you never, maybe around a communion or something, that's why we don't pass a horn. If you don't want to walk up and put anything in that horn, I don't need your money. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being truthful. That's between you and God. You figure it out with God. But if you want to operate financial <clears throat> principles in your life where God's abundance will flow into it, I'm teaching you how. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. How far are you willing to trust God? Okay. A lot of people stop when it comes to finances. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. How much of your heart are you willing to give to God? You want to know what a sad testimony is? I'll tell you what a sad testimony is. 
It's that testimony, talking about Christians now, instructed Christians. Some instructed Christians who know this material, okay, give more to their political party than they do to God. That's a sad testimony. Who they trust in it. And that's the truth. I know people, and I know of people, that give more of whatever than they do to God all year. That makes, that makes zero sense, doesn't it? Makes zero sense. How far are you willing to trust God? See? Oh, it's okay when we were preaching, but now you're meddling. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I ain't meddling. I'm just telling you the scripture. You go fight with God. Don't matter to me. I'm not the one that's going to bless you. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruit of thy increase. Matthew 22, 21 says this, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are what? God's. You know what some people render? They render the things that are God's unto Caesar. That shouldn't be, because we're supposed to seek what? God first. We seek God first. But you seek him first in all areas of life. Deuteronomy 18, or Deuteronomy 8, 18, this is a wonderful scripture. Listen to this. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto the fathers as it is unto this day God gave you power to get wealth he gave you the abilities he gave you the gifting he gave you good health he gave you a sound mind See? and the word encourages us that we should remember him Proverbs eleven twenty four says there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that scattereth and yet increases. And there is that which withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Scattereth is sowing. And when you sow, it increases. And then there's people that withhold more than they need to. And withholding that which they have to give, the result of that, it says, it tends to what? Poverty. Poverty. And, they, and people do it to themselves. And it's not you lose money, per se, or you get a cut in your pay, per se. Okay? Everybody knows... That I never get rid of a car. Okay, my cars last forever. You know why my cars last forever? First and foremost, because financially, I, I operate financial principles. Think. God is able to bless and protect me in areas, and anyone who operates financial principles in areas where it doesn't drain your bank account, that you're putting in a hot water heater every two weeks, or you're putting in a heater every three years, or you're putting in a roof every five years, or your plumbing goes better, because that's all money, 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 money. See? It says, there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it leads only to what? Poverty. You have to know how to save, but you also have to know how to spend and how to invest. And I want to tell you of all the investments that are out there today, and there's a lot of good ones, you can't bet a better investment than God. Okay. And I'm going to close this morning in Psalm 37. So I would just ask that I wanted to just present the scriptures to you. And I wanted for your consideration so that if this is an area in your life that you want to operate, that you want to trust God on, that you want to 
you know, endeavor to apply, you can. And if you don't, that's okay too. Because I've said this a hundred times, I'll say it a hundred times again. I don't look at money. I don't look in there. My wife handles the money. I don't keep track of money. I don't know how much money I have. I really don't. I don't have a clue. I don't know how much she has stacked. I don't know. But I could care less. Money never meant nothing to me like that. I have something to eat. I have something to wear. If I need something, I, but I just don't have a money problem. Never went after it. Never let it do anything. I just don't care about money. I care more about what I'm going to eat tomorrow for lunch than I do money. Honestly. But God has always provided for me. And I'm nobody special. And he will provide for you. But he, you can't receive a harvest unless you plant seed. <laughs> See, it's just that simple. That you got to plant seed. And then you'll get the harvest. And with the seed that you plant, I want to tell you this. There are no spiritual deers <coughs> that will eat up your harvest. <laughs> okay? Like I got around here. <laughs> Psalm 37, verse 25 says this. And I'm just reading the scripture because I'm not describing myself in this scripture. Okay. I have been young and now I'm old. That's not me. <laughs> just reading what the word says. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's God's abundant promise to you. All through your life, when you're young, all the way up to your old, you know what? God will be there. He'll provide for you. And this is simply just another way of the many, many ways that God provides for you. He'll provide for you in your finances. He'll provide peace for you. He'll provide love for you. He'll provide mercy for you. He'll provide compassion for you. See? He provides all these things but there's keys in the word of God and there's things that you should be doing if you want to receive and walk into these blessings. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, your goodness. And thank you, Father, that we can receive your word with a pure heart. And I pray that they would consider these things in their minds and in their lives. And thank you, Father, for your abundant provision that you always give us. In the name of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Chapter and Verse Ministry. We have newsletters, articles, podcasts, and videos posted on our website at www.cvm.church. We also post videos regularly on Rumble and on BitChute. Don't forget to like our video and to hit the bell icon if you want to know when another video is coming out. Love is a God If you love, you're born of Him Love Washed away all our blame. Come on, let's love each other. Let's speak the word to one another. If God so loved, we ought to love too. He gave his only son so that we could be as one. That's God's love. Love is of God. If you love, you're born of him. Love washed away. Fast.
God couldn't make it any better, no. That's God's love. Thanks, Carmen.